The American Dream avec le génie français. We're live. Hello, amazing tech and business lovers. I'm Eric, your French tech ambassador. Today, we have the infinite pleasure to welcome infinite. the elite of the elite, the creme de la creme, the exquisite. <laughs> it's always like this? Uh, always. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Jean-Baptiste Rudel. Good morning. Known as JB. Thank you. The best of the best among us. Whoa. So, JB. I'm getting embarrassed. <laughs> Wait, so, let's I have get more to, the to point. embarrass you. <laughs> really? <laughs> so, could so, you introduce. What can I do for you today? Can you introduce yourself a little bit quickly? I have, we have a lot of questions from the audience uh, that I would like to ask you. So, so um, you know, I'm a French entrepreneur, I've, um, I've been funding uh, several startups. That's pretty much what I can say about me, and then I'll let you fire the questions. Excellent. So I would call you Mr. Nothing is Impossible, okay. uh, just because you wrote a very good book that uh, everyone should read about how you, how you started, all the uh, pivots you had to do when building Criteo. So Criteo is one of the leading uh, French unicorns. Jean-Baptiste is one of the few who, uh, who was able to start the company in France and IPO in NASDAQ. Yes, in NASDAQ, yes. So Criteo is uh, $2 billion of market cap, 3,000 employees roughly. Depends on the day, <laughs> you know. Stock price going up and down, so that's life. <laughs> so maybe uh, before we dive into uh, entrepreneurship matters and how you view business, how you view Europe, etc. Yes. Uh, a few highlights on your career. So you want me to give you highlights on my career? Yeah. So um, like uh, moments of truth. Exactly. Where life had changed for me. Um, I think the first one was when I sold my first startup before Criteo called Kiwi. It was a um, ringtone uh, product, um, which looks completely out of fashion today. <laughs> but in the early 2000s, it was, it was pretty, it pretty was cool. A big business. Um, actually, it's, it plateaued very quickly. It started very nicely, but it plateaued very quickly. And I managed to, s um, to sell the company in 2004. And this was a life-changing event for me because suddenly, you know, I made some money and I could take more risk and look at life bigger. I think this helped me a lot for my next uh, venture, Criteo, um, and to let push myself outside of my comfort zone because uh, I'm a very cautious person. You know, I always think that uh, I'm going to fail. And when you have first success, well, it's, makes it easier then to do more bold moves. So this was probably the first important step. The second one was when, after three years of um, horrible uh, disappointment on Criteo, we eventually found the right formula, the right you know, product mix and go to market. And um, we were running a test run with the first client and the KPI was just amazing. And we just couldn't believe it, like, wow. If this is true, then this is going to be a very big business. And this was, you know, some, some amazing time where you know that the three years you've been suffering with your team, now you're going to get to something. Wow. It was still a long road, and we had no idea this would uh, end to the NASDAQ, or the step would be the NASDAQ, because it's far from an ending. Yeah, of course. Um, but still, it was, yeah, one of the most inspiring time for an entrepreneur is when at last you crack the model because you spend most of your time struggling, not finding the right thing. So, so what's your philosophy about experimenting? How, where, when do you, where do you start? How do you end? When is it too little? When is it too much? That's a very difficult problem. And um, I think 
when you gain experience over time and you've been through several ventures, you know much better how to scale a business. But when it comes to find the perfect product, there is no magic formula. And um, there is no way you can sh do any shortcuts. You have to try, iterate, and um, until you find the, uh, the right thing. So what's difficult is how much time do you spend on each iteration? If it's too short, obviously you don't have enough time to, uh, to nurture your idea, but if it's too long, you're just wasting your time and you know, life is short. And um, I used to say that you know, the right balance was something between six and 18 months. Now I tend to try to uh, have shorter cycles um, because even 12 months for an iteration, it's a very long time. And I think what you learn with experience is not a better way to find the perfect product, but you realize faster that you are going nowhere and that you need to change uh, where, where, what you do. You, cannot, you don't lie to yourself as much as before um, because you, you know better the, you know, the price of lying to yourself. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so with my new venture after Criteo, uh, we've been iterating faster, like three iteration in 12 months, okay. which is kind of um, three times the pace we've done at Criteo. Yeah. Doesn't mean we're gonna find the perfect thing, but at least we're trying more. And for you, how do you measure if an iteration is a success or not? So of course well, you, you, uh, you have KPIs. You have three scenarios. Yeah. One is it's a complete failure. And then <laughs> you should, that's, is, that's yeah, a very that's, easy yeah. one uh, <laughs> because then it makes you iterate very quickly. The second one is a big success. And you know by the, by the KPI, you know that something amazing is happening. And the difficult one is the one in the middle, which happened very often, uh, where it's okay, there is some traction, but there's still a lot of friction. And usually the temptation is to keep doing and trying to improve what you do. Incrementally. And incrementally, and usually 90% of the cases, it doesn't go anywhere. And you're just gonna spend years and years optimizing a model which has fundamental flaws, a model that doesn't scale that much. And I know many amazing entrepreneurs, they got stuck into this, mm. I would call this dead zone, where it's, it's too big just to shut it down. Local minimum. And too small to be anything really that's gonna be life changing. Uh, and so it's very you, hard. How did you make that decision? How did you make that decision in Criteo? So you, you did several pivots. Mm -hmm. I guess that were, that were hard decisions to make. Uh, it, it actually, is, yeah, it's, it's, it's not that hard. What, what is, well, it is. Um, but the hardest thing is when you know, and it happens all the time, you know what you're doing is going nowhere if you are really true to yourself, but you don't know how to pivot. You don't know what's the next thing you should do that's more promising. And so what do you say to your team? Do you say, guys, you know, just go home and let me figure out something different <laughs> and then we'll go back? Or, but this doesn't work. If you do this, the whole thing is gonna collapse. So what happens in, re in real life is that you say to people, keep doing what you do. Even if you know that it's not going anywhere, so it's a very awkward situation where the team is working hard on something which you know is going nowhere. But before you find this next thing, you have yeah. to keep you you know, to. the momentum going on so the team stay, uh, stay motivated. Mm. And this is probably the hardest time. Once you find this next bright shining thing, um, so you have to sell it to the team. And yeah. it's kind of the first exercise if your ID has any legs, is how easy it is, is it to sell to the team. If, if it's a powerful idea, usually it's relatively easy to uh, get that convinced. If it's, you know, uh, clumsy in one way or another, mm. then it's gonna be much harder and this should be a red light. And how do you make your team follow you after one, two, three pivots where every time you sold something that sounds very promising and then you, you reach a plateau or you reach something and you want to go higher so you, you, you are ambitious, but it means that 
some of the hardware that the team produced, you have to throw it away. Yeah, it's, um, it's hard. And um, some people, they just can't stand this. And you get, typically in this phase, you get a lot of attrition. You know, turnover, people leaving the company because they are not comfortable with those, those, this pivoting thing. Uh, for some people, it's very hard to throw away what you've been doing for six to 12 months. Um, it's you know, necessary. it's heartbreaking. Yeah. It is necessary. So yeah. are you comfortable to do this and you're going to stick for the next iteration or you're going to have to find the next project? But if you want to join an early stage startup that has a product which is not, you know, market proven, you need to be comfortable with those iterations. Otherwise, You'd rather join a project at a later stage where it's scaling, which requires a different kind of skills. And um, yeah, there is a world for everyone, I guess. So can you tell us about the day you made your, the IPO? How was it for you? Uh, so this is something I go in quite, <laughs> in quite a lot of details in my book. So <laughs> that's a good opportunity to uh, do some advertisement. It's, uh, exactly. There is a French and an English version. Yeah. Um, What it's, was the, uh, it's a English day where title you are. Um, the English title of your book. I know it in French, but. It's very much a translation of the, okay. of the French one. It's so a, I've uh, been told that it was impossible. Exactly. And it's the, yeah. your manifest. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, manifesto is probably too big no. of a word, but anyway. Uh, you know, you have Let's to make it. some compromise Let's with your editor. <laughs> Um, <laughs> you know, editing is a business uh, at the end of the day. It, so is, it is. They're here to sell books. Uh, um, so yeah, this was a this was a, was a day where I was just playing my role. So probably not the you know the most exciting day of my life. Far from it. So you are just staging everything, and it's you're still very nervous because so a lot of pressure. The whole thing like. can collapse, yeah. and you've been through three weeks of the exhausting road shows and you're like boy you know this has to work <laughs> no matter what <laughs> otherwise i'm gonna look like a fool my team's gonna look like a fool and it, it's gonna be a nightmare for everyone so yeah there is some so you gentle pressure i'd say <laughs> um, so you're still chairman of criteo i am indeed yeah and so you're part of the board but in terms of day-to-day -day business we have a ceo now who's running the company on a day-to-day -day uh, way. Yeah, absolutely. And now you have a new venture. I do, absolutely, yes. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's called Less? Yes. So what's your vision for that? So, yeah, this is kind of a funny, uh, funny name. Um, why is Less? Because we want, we're in the transportation industry. We want to have less cars, less pollution, less traffic in cities. Um, we all know that this is a big issue uh, and, um, and it's going to get worse in the future. Worse, yeah. And why is that? Uh, this whole idea of going to the transportation business was, uh, you know, the Internet. There are, you have many segments of the Internet which are today very mature. So it's hard to find a new venture and change the world because just, um, the market is, um, is um, too far ahead. In transportation, the game is very open. And we all know that down the road, so to speak, there is a big uh, revolution coming up with- um, Driverless cars. Uh, yeah, to, uh, autonomous cars. And uh, probably the thing that's been triggering this idea in the first place was look, seeing all those little anno annoying Google cars in, in, <laughs> you know, browsing man to view so, streets. Right. And um, I was like, whoa, Is this, again, is going to be an American world, or could we, European, be part of the game? Um, and we have a very big uh, automotive industry in Europe, so uh, there is a real place for, uh, for Europe there. Uh, now, what could I do as an entrepreneur? You know, I'm not going to start an, um, you You're know. not going to build your uh, own car. Uh, my own not car yet. company, not an yet. automaker. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, the French and the Germans are very good at that. Um, so what's going to change in this future that needs to be uh, fixed? If you think about what's the fundamental reason to do uh, autonomous cars, it's to make going from A to B more appealing. Whenever it's going to be cheaper, more convenient, more secure, you know, you name it. 
but it, it's going to make the option to, to sit in a car from point A to point B uh, more um, attractive. Definitely. And what does it mean for big cities when it's more attractive to take cars? It means more cars in the streets. So Definitely. more traffic, more congestions, exactly what we don't want. Yeah. So there's something a bit wrong or tense about this whole vision about autonomous cars is that you make car transportation more attractive and at the same time, the amount of space you have in cities, it's finite. And it's not going to grow. So what do you do? So uh, the solution is to densify uh, cars. Today, uh, in most cities, you have 1.1 um, on average uh, people per car, yeah. which means you have typically three uh, empty seats, yeah. which are completely uh, useless. Um, so the whole idea of less is to uh, try to market those free seats um, and try to fill those free seats with people. And uh, so you would have less cars, and you have to do this in a very smart way. So that's what we're trying to do. Pretty Brilliant. Much. Will you be the, the first car sharing on Mars? <laughs> well, Mars is a different topic. <laughs> it's, uh, we've been discussing this. It's <laughs> it's Elon Musk going to Mars. <laughs> that's the topic of my next book. Joke. Okay. <laughs> So you chose to, to start this new venture uh, in Paris. I did, yeah. You, Actually, you, you I, could definitely start it everywhere. Yeah, and, and especially your in background. Especially in Silicon Valley, because especially I'm based in Silicon, Silicon Valley. Valley. And I've been thinking a lot about, yeah. you know, where should I start this next venture? And my first move was, yeah, hey, let's do it in Silicon Valley. I'm here now. It's exciting. That's the center of the world. And then I was like, wait a minute. I want to build the most amazing, amazing engineering team. Where I going to, what's my likelihood to build it here versus in, in, in Paris? And then it's a no brainer that it's, I, I can find much stronger engineers in, in, in France. It's a mix of both my personal brands and um, my co-founders, obviously, and the fact that we have a lot of, lot of talents in, in Paris and there is less competition from, you know, uh, yeah. the, the big guys also in, uh, in Paris. And last but not least, it costs a fraction of what it would cost me here in Silicon Valley. So when you put all, all together, it's much more efficient to build a team in France uh, to start a new company than here. So this is why the team is in Paris today. Yeah. Great. So a little bit more about recruiting and, and growing a company. So for you, what makes a good team? So when you have people with track records, it's very easy. But when you assemble for the first time a team, what, what, how do you... Well, I'm going to say, you know, I'm, I'm just going to name the obvious, but you want a people that, ha that have complementary skills. And uh, one of the things you have to know as a founder is what are my own shortcomings? What are the area where I'm rather weak or I don't have a lot of appetite for? Mm -hmm. And this is areas where I should focus to find people with a... Uh, and with, you have a psychology a, test, you with have the right, right skills. <laughs> IQ test, you test you, them yeah, at foosball, no, or how you, do you do? You can do whatever test you want. <laughs> at the end of the day, you're always looking for the same thing, you know, professional people, reliable people, smart people, and dedicated people. Yeah, it's always the same thing. And, mm -hmm. and, and you think you, you can find out about this during interviews or it's you, very for hard. you uh, an interview is just a first filter and you will see other typically the best is obviously if you have a past working experience with the person then it makes it much easier I mean, you know it's yeah, once more it's obvious yeah. and when when i look at all my co-founders on my new venture is all all people i've been working with in the past because that's the best predictor of future uh, is what were the the work uh, ethics in, a, in, a, in the past. Um, if you don't have this luxury, if you have to pick between people that you've never been working with, I must admit it's much harder. And um, at the end of the day, you have to rely on your guts and admit when you are wrong as quickly as possible. So do you always take yeah. too long to let go of someone uh, for which for whom, for whatever reason, the, there's no fit with the project, then you have to act quickly. 
and typically so, I always act too slowly. <laughs> like, uh, like everyone, yeah, you know. Yeah, it's, it's, it's so uh, difficult. So typically during hyper growth, you have to do all this hiring yep. where you're not yep. sure yep. and you're... So how did you manage to do that? Well, you typically span in the hyper growth phase. Did you, you typically clone spend, your guts, uh, or how did you do? Forty percent of your time on recruiting. hiring and recruiting, so it's a big commitment from you and the rest of your team. And um, you try to, you know, um, inject your culture and your spirit um, towards other people, so that you can delegate this recruiting thing, uh, so it doesn't become a big burden for yourself. When, when, once you go beyond, you know, 100 people, it gets very hard to um, know everyone in, in person. So you have to rely on other people to, uh, you know, disseminate the culture. Mm -hmm. And to disseminate that culture, did you put programs in place with core values and as uh, a lot of Silicon Valley startups have to do with uh, a lot of things on the wall and uh, hanging I from the ceiling and... Uh, this Bouncing is more, on, oh. I would say this is more when you get to 400 people that you start to do the process on the world. Uh, because you have to create some myth, you know, you yeah. have some very skilled people telling you that any organization be, being on a certain size, they need to be based on myth. And, and typically around so three, to you, 400, uh, three to 400. Three to 400, yeah, yeah. threshold. Uh, because at this stage, you don't have even a physical contact to yeah, everyone in, in the company. So the way you communicate through them, to them is through powerful ideas and your vision. Uh, for the earlier stage, it's just your behavior. The way you act is going to influence a lot how people are going to act around you, your first circle. And then it's going to have ripple effects to the others. So you can, you know, you can claim whatever cultural thing and great ideas. At the end of the day, it's how you're going to act every day in a meeting room, in one-to-one -one meetings. You already you interact with emails, and people is going to start acting the, the way you are. Yeah, yeah. And you see, the company culture is very much influenced by the personality and the behavior of, uh, of the founding team. Did you read a lot about that, or did you find out? Wow, was it experimentation? Uh, it's experimentation I mean, at the end of the day, and you know when you look at big companies, um, high-profile companies like like a Google, a Facebook, an Amazon, an Apple, you know just to quote a few of them, you can, th and when you interact with people, you can understand a lot of things, knowing the type of culture the founding team ha has put into the company. And they have very different ways to interact with their, with their ecosystem. And it's very telling. Okay. So for engineering, basing the company uh, in, uh, in Paris was an obvious choice. What about sales? What about marketing? What about investing? Well, sales and marketing, it's, it's much more straightforward. You, you, have to, you have to have them in the field. So wherever your market is, you, your sales and marketing team has to be. So if your number one market is the US, then this should be the core. Your team should be in the US um, by definition. And same thing in, uh, in, in other markets. Depends, obviously, what type of go-to-market uh, model you have. You know, if it's more a tier one B2B, when you need, uh, you need uh, Face to face meetings, or if everything can be done through the internet. But net net, yeah, you want to be close to your customers. Did you learn things about sales and marketing coming in the US? Or? Coming to the US was uh, you know, a life changing event for me in a way that um, I thought I knew Americans, but they're just so different. And uh, you don't learn that much they through think movies. The same about you. Right? And um, <laughs> it was a bit of a shock for me to manage American people. It took me, you know, several years to understand uh, the mindset and um, how different it is than managing European people. And it's um, yeah. You, at the end of the day, you're not trying to say that one is good, one is bad. You're trying to take the best of the two worlds. So I think the best, uh, the best companies, they are taking what's best in, in the US, what's best in Europe, and try to bundle this together. It's what we've tried to do with mm -hmm. Criteo. And um, uh, we pride ourselves to be a very international company with no obvious center. And uh, we are very strong both sides of the pond here in the US and also in Europe. So you traveled a lot as a young professional. Mm -hmm. 
Asia, all across the world. Mm -hmm. uh, how instrumental was it to the next phases of your career? I think the most important thing is to, um, it's obvious, but to speak English because that's the language of business. So there is one thing to do if you want to have a working tech is to learn English. But apart from that, you know, each country is, is different. First time I landed in Japan to start, you know, the crypto business in Japan, I was completely scared. I arrived at the airport, <laughs> I had zero connection. I was like, shit, what are I going to do now? Uh, I need to do something of, you know, uh, the coming week. It's uh, the only reason why I, I went to Japan is I met some, uh, some German guy in a, you know, in a tech party. He told me he went to Japan. And uh, I was like, oh, this must be a nightmare. And he said, <laughs> actually not, because it's so rare to have Western people going to Japan that you can have amazing meetings with top, top level executive, much better than in the US, because they're very curious. Why is this guy is coming here? Yeah, well, he must have something interesting. <laughs> and it's exactly what happened to me. I had meetings with top people at Yahoo, at Rakuten. And I was amazed how easy it was to reach to a high level executive in Japan much easier than in the US, where it took me years and years before I could get to the, uh, the corner office. Brilliant, wow. So for less, and doing it after Criteo, do you have an expectation to do better than Criteo? <laughs> or is it just, I want to change that, that part of the society, and I'm going to focus on that? And, uh, I think number one is one step at a time. Number one is the pleasure to go back to an early stage startup where you're completely uh, uh, clueless of what you're going to do. <laughs> and I like this excitement of something completely new. Or some, I'm learning a lot every day. Every day, it's, uh, it's a new sector. Um, so that's probably my number one driver. A lot of people expect that, you know, after Criteo, you're going to do necessarily something even bigger, um, you know, uh, we wish, I, we wish you. I cannot deny this, but you know, at the end of the day, we'll see. And um, when you look at the odds of a startup to succeed, they are very low. So you do what you can and <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> and just make sure you have fun uh, during the journey. In a few words, because I, it could take a, uh, what's missing on the European scene to, to build more unicorns and global companies? So that's a, that's a very good question. I've been you know, trying to um, scratch this, uh, this topic in many different angles. I don't think it's about um, money. There was a lot of uh, very good uh, VC uh, firms in Europe. And now even US ones are willing to invest in Europe. It's not about scales. We have, as we said, the top engineers and uh, we're lacking some experience because some type of projects um, you can find only um, in the US. So uh, to build those skills in Europe is going to take time. But I think the one thing we need to change, which is probably the hardest, is the culture. And it's a lot of, lot of things. Um, and I go in great detail in my book again. Yes. But it's really about, it's... Uh, you know, the ability to, to share uh, the adventure with um, with uh, both co-founders, investors, and employees. Still, a majority of European startups don't offer stock options to all their employees. Um, and this has to change if you want to apply uh, US standards. And it's also, um, how do you think big? And uh, how do you try to avoid having mental barriers on what you do? And this is something I've been struggling with for a long time. And now I've built a, a think tank on this topic called the, the Gallium Project. And I want to do some little mm -hmm. advice, um, advertisement for this. So this is for founders to help them to scale to the, to the next level, not, not to find them, the, to find a great idea. Nobody can do this for them. But once you are at a certain stage, you don't want to reinvent the wheel on how to manage your board, when to bring US investors, how to do, you know, incentive plans and all those things. And we're trying to do, uh, you know, uh, different events on this. Actually, in a, in, a, in a couple we'll of post, weeks. We'll post a link. Uh, well, we, we, we had a term sheet for the, um, that we've been publishing a year ago with standard mm -hmm. terms. Next week, we are 
publishing guidelines for how to provide stock options to employees. Awesome. And so uh, trying to raise yeah. the industry yeah. as a whole. Uh, and to uh, highlight best practices. Because at the end of the day, you know, some people do things right, typically after a lot of iteration. And if, you, if that can give this um, a shortcut for the others to uh, kind of accelerate, it would be awesome. Awesome. Yes. It is already. That's the idea. Great. Two minutes to finish. So how do you manage your time? Um, how do I manage my time? Yeah. Uh, well, Are you a proponent my, of the uh, my inbox is my to-do <laughs> list. So if you want me to do something, you just send me an email, uh, which is probably very old fashioned in this uh, mobile world. Um, Efficiency is key. But you know, at the end of the day, we all have our little tricks. This yeah. is mine, yeah. Are you a proponent of the 80 hours week or? Actually, um, during all my time as, the, um, as an entrepreneur, I always take a lot of vacation, um, much more than when I was a salary man. And the reason is, is usually during vacation that I have my best ideas. This is where suddenly I have, you know, I have breakthrough ideas because I still work during vacation mm -hmm. time. But when you're in different uh, landscape, a uh, different background, this is where cre creativity kicks in. So I strongly encourage people, you know, make sure you take some breaks and usually good things happen. Excellent advice. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks Any, very much. Just uh, one yeah. two last questions. Any business hero for you that you think that's take inspiration from? Oh, that I take inspiration from, well, um, from a, you know, from a lot. I think for Criteo, the very inspiring company was Google. And there's a lot of things that we share in terms of DNA. And um, we got a lot of best practices and an idea to roll out the company through uh, what they've done. Okay. And this is probably the company I've been studying the most okay. <laughs> mm. uh, in my career. And yeah. <laughs> Any favorite book to recommend apart from the one you wrote? <laughs> <laughs> um, which I don't necessarily recommend, you know. We can, um, I do. Books, yeah, yeah, you know, I, I, I don't read much uh, novels, mostly um, books on, you know, either what's the future of the planet. Uh, right now I'm reading uh, books on biology. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty mm -hmm. fascinating that uh, we still have, we are lacking the basic understanding of what is life. And okay, for me, okay. it's, um, you know, it's fascinating. And what's going to happen in, in the next uh, decades uh, in terms of innovation in biotechs. I know nothing about that, but I find it tremendously uh, exciting. So awesome. We, we'll Jean-Baptiste, thank you so much. And My pleasure. Vive la French Tech. Go, 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 as we say. <laughs> The American Dream. Avec le génie français.